Uh, but I just want to say hello to everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, this is our September 2023 edition, the late summer uh, webinar for Idaho Department of Labor's Labor Market Insights Series. My name is Craig Shaw, and I am the Research Analyst Supervisor for the Labor Market Information, and I am also your host today. So um, today we have uh, kind of a special topic that we're, I think, all excited to talk about today. I'll be talking about veterans world and how that's and, and the, the germane part of that to the Department of Labor. And we'll be talking about the services that the department provides and can offer to our veterans community. Um, we are veterans of tremendous debt, and it's an honor to be able to highlight this topic for them. And uh, for those of you listening who have honored us with your service. Um, as part of that, we have a special guest as part of um, our panel today. Um, we have Denise Spring. She is a, um, a former Army veteran, and she's been with the Idaho Department of Labor for 10 years. Six of those, if I'm correct, um, you're welcome to correct me, uh, Denise, if this is uh, incorrect, but six of those have been uh, providing services uh, on behalf of the department to veterans. That um, is correct. Great, awesome. All right, all right. My information's right there, okay. Uh, we also have Matt Pascash. He is our labor economist in the Pocatello office for Southeast Idaho. And we also have Ryan Whitesides, who is in the Idaho Falls office, uh, representing Eastern side of Idaho. Um, just uh, some housekeeping to, to kind of get away, uh, get out of the way before we uh, turn it over to them and um, start our webinar. Um, if you have any questions during our, our webinar today, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, feel free to add your questions as we're going. Uh, I'll be the moderator on those questions for you and ask those on your behalf. Um, and we'll try to ask those kind of in the middle as we're going, but uh, obviously we'll, we'll save some time at the end to ask those questions as well. Um, one other note is that this presentation will be recorded um, and we will upload it later to YouTube for viewing and we will provide an at, uh, link to those of you that are on the call now and also um, to our um, stakeholders so they can view that at their, at their leisure. Um, you can also find our other webinars that we've recorded there as well that we've done over the past year. So um, with that, uh, we will kind of get started here. We'll, we'll start with Matt and I'll turn it over to him to kind of uh, uh, coordinate the rest of the discussion. But I just have one question that maybe to kind of lead into is, I mean, um, from a researcher standpoint, especially for Idaho and um, that, uh, state data for, for um, veterans, um, it's always kind of a challenge to find, uh, like, I, I guess, uh, data that's current and uh, kind of robust for Idaho and, and veterans. How did you find that when you were looking at this topic? Yeah, certainly. So um, at least speaking for myself, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics does track a lot of information nationally, uh, and, and some of which can be disaggregated down to Idaho. But um, given that a lot of our data is survey-based and with Idaho being a relatively small population, sometimes things like small sample issues um, either prevents or makes it difficult to, to report on some of these more um, very, uh, very hard to reach populations, uh, statistically at least. Um, but otherwise, the U.S. Census Bureau also uh, has many explicit questions in their annual American Community Survey um, that uh, allows us to, to track some of this data, maybe not as frequently as we would like, but um, we, we do have some, some, some data points we can get for, for Idaho to, to glean some very important information from. Um, so it's, it's a mixture of that, but also the Veterans Affairs Department um, also tracks it uh, internally as well, and they do report on this uh, this little set of subjects as well. So we kind of pulled from a lot of different, uh, a lot of our partner agencies to, to get a lot of this data. Okay. With that, I will start sharing the presentation. Just to make sure, is everyone seeing the presentation? Yes, it's coming through. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, as Craig had mentioned, we decided this month to go with veterans. They are a very important part of our of our population, the time they've served, uh, serving our country, both domestically and abroad. And we figured to take this as an opportunity to both look at some information on our veterans, veteran families, and a lot of demographics and socioeconomics of this population, but also kind of relate it back to a lot of the services we provide to veterans and employers looking to, to, to serve this community as well. And so this is gonna be a little bit of a, of a 
a different discussion that we typically have on these webinars where it's both data and some of the more um, statistical type of, of stuff that we, that we typically talk about as economists, but also Denise here to provide something more of uh, an overview of some of the services that potential people might value from. So to kind of set the stage for some of the discussions to follow, we figured that maybe we should kind of go through some, some general overview of some of the numbers to kind of quantify the US veteran population and by extension, um, the uh, Idaho subset of that population. So one important thing I, that I um, felt was very interesting um, going into this initially was just the change in the size of our armed services over the last, at this point, century. Um, in the last few decades, at any given time, we have about one and a half million uh, actively serving um, military personnel, and this is at least on a full-time equivalent basis. Uh, and that's been um, much less than in past eras, and especially during larger conflicts like we had seen in World War II. Uh, at its peak, we had in any given year uh, over 11 million people who were in some form of the armed services. And then during the Korean Vietnam War, um, they were approaching 4 million in any given year, but it's been a, a general downward trend. Um, so when we think of the US armed services today, it's not as large as it was. Um, and then given these large uh, past conflicts, we would expect to see uh, sort of large bumps in the veteran population corresponding to a lot of these uh, past eras. This illustration is a composition of the Idaho veterans population by service era. As you can see here, 8.6% of the Idaho population is of veteran status. And of that equates to about 1.3 times nationally. 6.4% uh, of the national population is of veteran status. And you can see kind of how e the veterans of each wartime era are represented here on the bar chart. The Vietnam War era has the largest era, excuse me, the largest share of Idaho veterans, kind of consistent with what you'll see nationally, followed by the post 9-11 conflicts uh, after 2001. And from the 122,000 total veterans uh, demarcated there on the right hand side, um, Idaho veterans, that's 122,000 Idaho veteran, that, veterans, that leaves a balance of about 17,000 veterans in other wartime categories, like Afghanistan, the war on terror, and other more recent conflicts. Idaho does have about the same ratio of veterans nationally. Um, about one in 10 veterans would be female representation, leaving the rest male representation. And, you, and you, as you can see there on the right-hand side, uh, pretty consistent nationally with what you'll get uh, with the statistics. As labor economists, uh, we often look at labor market outcomes as uh, sort of the, the stuff that we, we look at um, pretty much on a daily basis, uh, but we also track perhaps more on our monthly or annual basis. And one thing that, that sticks out in the stats that we'll get to later is sort of this discrepancy between our veterans versus uh, non-vets in terms of labor force participation. As we'll get to later, a lot of this can be accounted for what we uh, I previously mentioned with just the perhaps the, the large legacy of a lot of our vets from from past conflicts and eras uh, who are at this point considerably older than the non-veteran population. But still, there are perhaps some some reasons why some veterans may not be participating in, in the labor force and working that we'll, we'll get to in a bit. But otherwise, sort of a, a very salient uh, fact of the labor market is uh, a considerable difference in labor force participation rates. So we wanted to also emphasize kind of the touch point of labor market information for veterans, both nationally and locally here in the state. And as veterans matriculate back into um, social, back into society, they've retired from the military, they, they are claiming veteran status, the civilian labor force uh, can now be can now account for them, whereas before, when they were active duty in the military, they were not counted toward the labor force participation. So the combined civilian labor force of the, of the employed and unemployed, 18 years of age and over, 
are shown here on this table from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I have highlighted the Idaho um, percentage of the population in the civilian labor force. These are veterans, 44% there, 44.7%. Uh, and then uh, the uh, other portion would be the green portion below that, 47.9% is the labor force participation there in the United States. So we can see that the Idaho um, representation is about three percentage points higher than the national number there. And in turn, Idaho percentage of veterans as part of the labor force participation rate is three per percentage points lower than the national average. Uh, they are at 43.3%. Over to the percentage of the unemployed labor force, um, it's a half a percentage point higher in Idaho than you'd see uh, nationally at 2.8%. So this is why the services that Denise and her team provide are so critical to getting veterans back into the labor force. Although you will see a lot of veterans who are of retirement age who will, will not be re-entering the labor force. And you'll also see that some may have a disability rating where they're not able to work. Uh, so those are kind of interesting factors to take into account when a veteran re-enters the labor force or enters it for the first time. And later in the webinar, we're gonna highlight veterans marketability in the workforce as a highly experienced and educated demographic that can be tapped into pretty much, I think as an untapped resource um, that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay. So with that, we're gonna transition to some of our services. So veterans bring distinctive capabilities to civilian employers, as well as valuable training and technical skills for a variety of reasons. Um, I get asked quite often by employers, you know, I would love to hire veterans. Can you give me some ideas on how I can recruit more veterans for my business? And so I want to cover a couple of great resources that the Department of Labor has to help businesses with recruiting veterans. So the first thing is we often have events going on at the Department of Labor. For example, uh, we have job fairs at um, almost every office. And so employers can go online to our website, look at upcoming events, and they're able to participate in job fairs at no cost to them. If you don't see an upcoming event in your area, I would still reach out to your local office and discuss your employment needs. What are you looking to hire? And so sometimes they can create customized job fairs uh, to help you with recruiting for your business. In Idaho Works, that's part of the Department of Labor website, employers are able to go in, set up a registration uh, to be able to post jobs within our system. And then job seekers are able to set up a profile. As part of that profile, it does help to identify veterans. And job seekers are able to post up to five resumes in the system. And so this here shows that Employers are able to go in and do a search based upon maybe an occupational code and a zip code that you're looking to hire somebody. And it'll bring up a list of resumes that are active in the system. And employers can identify veterans by the flag next to their name. So when you do that search, that's an easy way to go in and see what veterans are in your part of the state that are looking for work and that you can contact. Throughout the state of Idaho with the Department of Labor, we have 10 veteran representatives. So every region has at least one, one veteran representative or more. Um, and if you look on your website, you'll see two terms. You may not be familiar with these. And so I thought it would cover what, does, what is a lever? What is a DVOP? What do they do and how can they help? So a lever or a local veterans employment representative is an individual that is a veteran that works for the Department of Labor, and their primary job is to conduct, is to do outreach to employers and to businesses to advocate for the hiring of veterans. And so they're able to meet with businesses and give more personalized services on what can they do and how can they um, hire veterans. A disabled veterans outreach program, um, that's what I do. Um, so that's somebody that works for the Department of Labor. And again, they are a veteran. Um, they work one-to-one -one with veterans. So they're meeting with veterans that are looking for work, um, helping them with the resources they need. And so it may be um, helping to identify what their occupational goals are, doing career assessments, um, assisting with 
um, identifying if there's any training or things that can help them with those employment goals, as well as helping to connect them with employers. And so uh, throughout the state, these two uh, different roles can help both veterans as well as employers with connecting with veterans looking for work. Here's a little more details on things that the local veterans employment representative can do for a business. And so if you're a business and you're wanting to hire additional veterans, I would suggest reaching out and looking on our website and, and contacting one. We have four uh, levers throughout the state. So you can contact anyone statewide um, to get more information on, you know, different programs in Connect that can help with recruiting veterans. Um, one example I'll give is on here, there's a program called SkillBridge. And what that is, that's a, dep a Department of Defense program where somebody that's currently in the military can do an internship with a civilian employer that's applied with the Department of uh, Defense and been approved as an employer for that. And the Department of Defense pays that service member's wages for six months while they're training with that civilian employer. And so that is really huge. Not only does it help businesses with uh, recruiting uh, individuals from the military, it helps somebody that's in the military with transitioning to civilian employment. Um, so all of these great programs are something that uh, your business can contact the local veterans uh, employment representative and discuss what are your specific needs and what are some of these programs that may benefit your business. Thanks, Denise. Um, before, while we're still on the topic of um, veterans and our services, um, and perhaps how they're uh, very uh, a valuable, if perhaps um, uh, unrecognized part of our workforce, our recent employer business climate survey, uh, we had asked respondents to sort of give a, a general um, um, assessment of their current workforce and how many of their existing workers uh, have certain general skills to what in their minds was to an adequate degree. And we also uh, asked them for what would you be your needs for these skills over the next five years. And um, surprising to us as, as uh, the labor economist team who put the survey together, um, many of the skills that seemed to be the most deficient were uh, many soft skills like uh, leadership and managerial skills, things like time management, <laughs> Things like uh, teamwork um, and interpersonal relationship building, um, which all seem like to be very essential skills to to anyone serving in, in our in our armed forces, given just uh, sort of the, the the nature of the work and the the need to be able to both uh, work within uh, a larger organization, but also to take on responsibilities and 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 to take charge uh, when called upon. Um, and so, I guess the question I have for you then is is um, do you see many of these skills and many of these um, uh, these talents of our veterans as being indispensable to um, to prospective employers uh, looking to hire? Absolutely, veterans bring a lot of uh, transferable skills, uh, no matter what occupation that they served in. Like you said, uh, teamwork is a very huge part of the military. Uh, and that's something that they bring, as well as having discipline and staying focused, um, having flexibility, um, being able to do one thing one day, but the next day you're doing something completely different. You may um, be working at a base and then you may de be deployed. Uh, quite often you may work outside of your occupational field. Um, there's a very good uh, managerial uh, process that they have in the, in the military uh, where you are constantly training to move up and to advance and to um, take control, to take supervision and um, being able to lead members of your team. And so those are all transferable skills as well as they also bring a lot of great technical and training skills from the occupations that they serve in as well. Nice, okay. It's great to know. And for many of our veterans uh, listening, um, definitely include that on your uh, resumes and CVs when when talking with employers is uh, a very valuable set of skills that a lot of employers are looking for right now. So, so yeah. as we yeah, I'm sorry to interject, but we do have one question that's kind of related to that. 
I was wondering if, if we have time um, in the middle here. Um, it's a question from an active active officer now that uh, is looking to retire um, is asking about the skill bridge, the Department of Defense skill bridge and how the Department of Labor is supporting that. Um, and maybe you could kind of explain that a little bit and kind of uh, what, what you know, if maybe it's something we connect with the person later and provide more information, but maybe you can provide, provide a brief um, explanation of that and, and how that might, how the Department of Labor uses that. Well, I would say it's it's a tool that uh, a lot of the local veterans employment representatives, when they're meeting with employers and they're explaining the benefits of hiring veterans, um, they explain what that program is and how they can be enrolled in that. Um, we do have the Veterans Chamber of Commerce out of Boise that does an, a training um, every week on that, and they can provide information on how the employer can attend that training. Uh, myself, quite often I get veterans that will call me, you know, and so they'll say, hey, I see that you're in the state of Idaho. I'm looking for employers in your part of the state that may be participating in that. And so helping them with connecting to the employers in, in my part of the state. Um, the Department of Defense does have a search tool on their website that you can search by location. And so veterans that are interested in SkillBridge can look and see what employers are currently participating. Um, and then I know that there are quite a few employers that are probably going through that process. It's the government of, of they've started the process of applying and they're getting through that approval process. So I know there'll probably be quite a few more employers um, interested in participating or that have already started that process and are waiting to get on that approval list. Okay. Um, it's a great, great question and a great response, Denise. So um, moving ahead. One of the things that um, interested me coming into this is we know, at least uh, we're working in the, the public sector, that many local, state, and federal government um, um, divisions and, and departments have a, a preferential hiring uh, policy for, for veterans. So that shouldn't surprise us to see there's a very large overrepresentation of veterans in, say, the federal government. But um, perhaps other sectors that um, may have an overrepresentation or underrepresentation of veterans was kind of what was a motivating question for me coming into this is where are veterans who are entering the civilian workforce uh, ending up? And this was uh, some data that I pulled from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, and this is just for 2022, so, so pretty recent. And this looks at sort of a, a, a ratio of the vet share of employment within every sector relative to non-veterans. and so anything that's positive in this uh, bar graph represents overrepresentation. Over anything that is negative would be an underrepresentation. And we would see uh, that sort of very large, uh, about four times as likely to be represented in the federal government uh, compared to non-vets, which again, shouldn't surprise most folks who, who work with the government in some capacity. Um, but was interesting to see was in, in some sectors, well, perhaps not Interest, not the most um, shocking to see was in some sectors like leisure and hospitality, um, things like accommodations, uh, food service. Generally speaking, those are for a lot of jobs with for, for people sort of beginning their careers and are going to be moving up the career ladder and perhaps out of those sectors in time for many of our veterans who have a lot of technical skills and a lot of, again, accumulated soft skills. Um, it probably won't seem like uh, the most opportune choice after they leave. Um, um, so we would not be surprised to see perhaps some underrepresentation there. But in other sectors like education and health services, uh, they're still also underrepresented. Um, and while in others like transportation, utilities, manufacturing, mining, coring, and oil and gas extraction, they're overrepresented there. And so I guess one question I'd have for Denise is in, in your experience as a vet and you with your work with our veteran communities is what's some of the factors that um, many of our veterans are considering as they're transitioning into the civilian workforce and where specifically they work? Well, probably the biggest thing that I hear for individuals getting out of the military is that they're looking for their second career. And so they're looking for a job where they can see themselves working long term. Um, so I can certainly see where maybe something at retail or something that's entry level. Um, they may be looking for something that's more 
um, going to support their family, more of a career position. Um, a lot of veterans work in the military, work in fields that um, may involve equipment or uh, um, maintenance of that equipment. And so I can certainly see where that can translate to the high demand in transportation and utilities, um, as well as a lot of veterans work in hazardous conditions. And so if you think about um, mining and ga gas extraction, I can certainly see where um, uh, the veteran experience would be very valuable in those occupations. Okay. Thanks, Denise. So um, one, like that, that salient fact that um, kind of stuck out to me and a lot of folks who look at the labor market is that difference in the labor force participation rate between vets and non-vets and to kind of help account for a lot of that, which again, if you're looking at it uh, at face value with some, without some of this context that might jump out as a very startling difference, but um, some of it, however, can be accounted for by what we can observe of these populations. And one of which, which really stands out is just the difference in, in the age makeup between our vets and non-vets. So given um, from that uh, earlier slide in the presentation, we have uh, very large bumps in the active, um, uh, those actively serving in, in say World War II, Korean War, Vietnam, and we sort of have the, the, the legacy of those conflicts um, sort of showing up in the, the disproportion of a lot of these people from those eras in the, the vet demographics. And so this one graph sort of paints that picture. If we look at the non-vet population, we see broadly speaking that there's a lot more uh, concentration of these individuals in the younger populations, uh, 18 to 34, 35 to 54, and then starts to taper off as we get moving further and further up the age brackets. But however, for our veteran population, we see that there's some noticeable bumps, um, both sort of in the middle age bracket, but especially in those who are already of sort of in retirement age uh, and, and well into what would prospectively be their retirement years. And that is going to be something which is going to be accounting for a large chunk of that um, labor force participation gap between our vets and non-vets. Um, another thing we consider when looking at labor force participation as sort of a, a, a very strong in, uh, predictor is educational attainment. So typically, as you gain more skills, more knowledge, more human capital, as we broadly call it, um, you become much more marketable. So that opportunity cost of, of not working, at least, increases given how much you can prospectively earn through your skills in the job market. Um, if we look at the, uh, the left side of this graph, uh, the share of adults at least who have less than a high school degree. So one of the, the uh, recruiting criteria for folks entering the armed services in the United States is you have to have at least a high school diploma or a high school equivalent. So we would not expect to find very many veterans to be in this sort of lower branch of the uh, educational distribution. Um, however, we do have uh, a lot of even uh, adults who are 18 years and older, who uh, at least in the non-vet population, who who um, do not have a high school diploma, um, and that definitely acts as uh, perhaps uh, an impediment to their transition into the labor market. Given just it's it's hard to signal your your um, marketability to employers. It's hard to be able to send a clear signal of your skills, uh, your knowledge, your, your technical expertise, and so on and so forth. Um, but then as we begin to move up the educational attainment bracket, we see a rough parity uh, between vets and non-vets when it comes to a high school degree or equivalent. Um, but then as we begin to shift into the college years, at least, vets seem to be a little bit more uh, overrepresented amongst those with some college through an associate's degree. And then once we get into a bachelor's degree and higher, then the non-vet population tends to, to, to be a bit more overrepresented compared to the vets. But broadly speaking, we think that at least that the, the notable absence of veterans in that, that left tier bracket, um, which are the ones which typically have uh, very low participation rates in the overall US population, um, given that underrepresentation, um, education is probably, um, if anything, helping them as they transition into the, the labor force. And again, um, time spent in the military is also time spent 
gaining valuable skills, technical knowledge, um, a lot of occupation specific training, um, which can then get translated into the civilian workforce once they transition out. Now, one thing that does stick out as um, uh, perhaps a, a, a barrier to, to some veterans to entering the civilian workforce is the presence of, of some disability, whether it is service connected or not. Um, and so what we had from the 2021 American Community Survey was that something about uh, tw vets were twice as likely at least to have some type of at least self-reported disability of, of some kind compared to our non-vet population. Now, some of this might be confounding effects of age. Um, generally, as you get older, you start to um, be more likely to have ambulatory issues of moving around, getting up, going up and down steps and, and so on, as well as perhaps hearing loss, uh, sight loss. Um, but still, if we even looked within age brackets, um, there may even be some um, higher prevalence of disabilities amongst even prime age, uh, prime working age uh, adults, uh, adult veterans compared to their non-vet counterparts. And so typically this is something that um, definitely there are resources available to help veterans who are, who are sort of having uh, to sort of overcome some of these, these challenges, um, but it is something to consider as what keeps perhaps some veterans out of the labor force. Um, and another key statistic that Brian was kind enough to, to find for me in some of his research was um, some of our more recent veterans in the post 9-11 era uh, seem to have a, a higher probability of receiving some service-connected disability compared to veterans in past eras. And I guess this would be a question for you, Denise, is, is some of this um, perhaps just more attention being put onto the, the, the issue and perhaps uh, a lot of, of our younger service people as they transition back into the civilian world um, have just uh, more knowledge of what to, to, to go and ask for in terms of services or when speaking with um, their healthcare providers of um, trying to get things diagnosed. Um, is that accounting for perhaps why some of our 9-11 or at least post 9-11 veterans seem to have a higher service connected disability rate than some of uh, veterans from past eras? Absolutely. The VA is getting much better and military is getting much better as service members are getting out with helping to identify those. And I would say, if you know of an older veteran or a veteran that has something that has not yet connected to the VA for that, you know, I would encourage them to reach out if you have one of those Vietnam era veterans, um, helping them to connect to those resources. Great. Yeah. So for many of our veterans um, watching, even if perhaps you've been out of the service for a very long time and you still have a, um, something, something you're encountering regularly that you think may be service connected, you, we encourage you to, to reach out and to, to get plugged in the resources to perhaps um, help you get the resources to manage, manage that as you go forward. So relating this now all back to that labor force participation rate, um, there's a, sort of a, a very simple tool that many labor economists use to, to look at differences and outcomes between two groups based upon what we can observe of those groups and, and more specifically the differences in, in what we can observe between those groups and what just we can account for. And so this was just one, um, one chosen specification of, of how I decompose this. And so I just took age, marital status, educational attainment, and disability status as sort of the four observables um, between veterans and non-veterans and their labor force participation rates, and then um, decomposed that gap for males and females along, again, the observable differences and then the unobservable or unexplained differences. And so by and large, uh, at least amongst males, uh, much of that gap can be explained by age and disability status, but we still have some unaccounted for um, part of that participation gap, which could relate to um, a lot of things. Um, I, I have many friends I grew up with back home in Indiana who went straight into the, the service and served in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I understand that there are um, many, I guess, more silent um factors that sort of might cause a, a bit of a hiccup in that transition back into the 
civilian workforce, but even in um, perhaps ideal circumstances, perhaps there might be other factors that might um, be a reason why they've um, not entered the, the workforce. And so I guess for you, Denise, is one question I'd have is, in your role, um, both working for the department and in your experience as a veteran, um, even if we um, account for some of the, the more um, uh, telltale reasons for a veteran not being in the workforce like age um, and disability status, what other issues might they encounter which might um, make that transition um, perhaps a, a little, um, little less um, easy for them? Well, and I think one area, and you kind of mentioned in some of the previous slides, would be educational attainment. So a lot of veterans may enter the military when they're young. Um, they may be able to start a degree, but because of frequent deployments, um, they may not finish that. And so a lot of veterans, when they're getting out of the military, they may take some time. They've got the GI Bill. They've got a little bit of a housing stipend. They may go back to school and finish up that degree. Um, a lot of times, um, that, that difference of completing the degree can help them to get into more of a career path, something that's more in line with um, the pay that they received in the military and something that may have more potential for advancement for them. Like I see a lot of veterans going into things such as business and management and um, using those degrees to be able to um, advance their civilian careers. Okay. Um... Uh, that is it for mine. So I'll turn it now over to Ryan to go through some of the interesting data he can find and, and uh, help broaden the discussion a bit more. Yeah, we just wanted to continue the conversation a, a little bit with socioeconomics of our veterans here locally. And uh, demographics have been a big um, part of the conversation as well. And that kind of ties in with um, my next slide here on the data with where vets are located geographically here in Idaho, because what they do and where they're located uh, is really important, um, obviously, because we can direct services to those locations, whether it's offices like Denise's with the DevOps and Levers, or also with where the VA offices are located in the VA healthcare centers. Um, so those conversations are really important and they pertain to this chart very quickly. Um, we have a surprising density of veterans in the rural counties of Idaho, like Butte, Custer, Lemhi, and Clearwater, denoted there in kind of the maroon color. And then we have a higher um, than state average uh, concentration of veterans. If you remember the state average uh, is 8.6%, and that would be highlighted there in that navy blue but you see those higher concentrations in the eastern and northern parts of the state of Idaho of where veterans live. Denise, I kind of wanted to throw a question over to you uh, with uh, re relating to the geography and, and where veterans choose to live. Uh, what's the draw to Idaho for a lot of the in-migration of some of these transplant veterans that choose to come and live here? They, might, they may not be from here or they may have lived here before, but they come back or they come here for the first time, you end up working with some of them in your office. What is the draw to Idaho generally that you may or may not see? Um, so some of the things that I see is that, you know, Idaho is a state that the population is a little bit small, smaller. You have a little more space and more, more freedom to move around. There's a lot of great outdoor and recreation. Um, so you think with military, you're doing a lot of things in the outdoors. And so they really enjoy doing that. A lot of veterans are wanting to have a family or wanting to set, settle somewhere where they feel like it's going to be a safe, good place to raise their family. Uh, low crime rate here, the cost of living compared to a lot of other areas may be lower. And I've really been surprised at the number of veterans I worked with recently that um, may have served in the military. They were from Idaho. And when they got out of the military, they actually settled in a different state but now they're moving back to Idaho. And so it's just kind of interesting to see that um, they're eventually coming back home, that they're, they're seeing that drive for the, the living circumstances here, as well as being here closer to other families, really is drawing a lot of veterans to Idaho. And that's really interesting on the next uh, thing that we'll be talking about is housing more specifically, because it is an overarching socioeconomic conversation. One thing that really stands out to me briefly here is the homelessness 
Uh, this was a snapshot back in uh, 2022 by Housing and Urban Development there at the bottom uh, that there were about 149 homeless veterans. That changes from day to day, of course, with uh, different people's um, you know, personal situations. But Denise, uh, do you have uh, something like a homeless uh, integration program or something to help homeless veterans? Uh, we can see kind of the housing statistics there. Uh, there is some successes in, in uh, veterans housing and veteran loans and so forth. But what are some programs that kind of help with veterans housing and, and even the homeless reintegration perhaps? So the state of Idaho currently has what's called a, it's a homeless veterans reintegration program. And what that is, that is an employment program. So it's to assist veterans that are either homeless or at risk of being homeless. And there is funding within that grant to help with the employment piece. And so it's looking at what do they need to get employed? Um, how, you know, maybe it's a car repair that's preventing them from, from getting a job. Um, maybe they, we're a mechanic in the military, but to get hired as a mechanic in the civilian force, you have to bring your own tools and they don't have those tools to provide. And so it can help with some of those related costs to getting employed. Uh, last year in the state of Idaho, we had 32 veterans that we enrolled statewide into that program. And I'm the case manager for uh, Southeast Idaho. So I cover the Idaho Falls region and um, throughout the state, if there are any veterans that, um, Think that they might be eligible for this grant uh, when you go to our website and look at veteran reps you would contact a local DBOP, a, a disabled veteran outreach program um, and they can assist you with seeing if you're eligible part of that grant is really working with a lot of community resources and so a lot of my time is spent going to a lot of different um, committee meetings um, being involved with the military committee uh, community here in, in my region um, helping to connect them, maybe they may qualify for the HUD bash. So those are uh, housing vouchers. Uh, whereas typically if somebody in the state of Idaho applied for Idaho housing, it's about a two year waiting list. Whereas with the HUD bash program, typically uh, veterans may be able to get a, a housing voucher with them just a couple of months and be able to quickly get into housing. And so helping them to identify some of those resources uh, there are a lot of resources out there for veterans, but there are a lot of different places. And so um, coming in and speaking with one of the representatives at the Department of Labor, we can help you with, you know, what's, what's your personal situation? What are you needing help with? And who would, who would you go to for that? And so really helping to identify those resources. That's really great insight. I think that kind of leads into uh, veteran families and kind of those people who are uh, living with the veterans um, and military spouses in particular. Uh, if we kind of look at, we can go ahead and populate all of these points here on this list. Um, something that really stands out to me is a non-employment rate among uh, veteran spouses, or they might start a business. There's different circumstances, but it does uh, state in this study from the Military Spouse Chamber of Com Commerce that there are 11.2 million veteran spouses uh, those are kind of the census statistics, but they've also done a study and a survey of about 4,100 veteran spouses as defined um, being husband and wife of an active duty military, a veteran or retired military house husband or wife. Now, uh, Denise, you can speak directly to this, uh, both personally and professionally as a military spouse on kind of what some of the challenges are of military spouses when the veteran is relocated um, and bringing the entire family with them um, and what that poses as a challenge if they're looking for employment, for example. Uh, can you speak to that personally and professionally as a military spouse? Absolutely. So um, as you said earlier, I served in the military. I was in for four years. And during the time that I was in the military, I, I married another service member. Um, and then I got out of the military because I had a child that was born with some medical problems and needed to stay home. And so probably one of the, the barriers that I faced personally was that um, with having a child with special needs, you know, I was out of the workforce for 15 years. And so getting back into the workforce, I have this 15 year gap. And so even though I had, um, you know, good military service. I worked at the Pentagon. I had a top secret clearance. 
Well, none of that was relevant anymore because of the time, the length of time between when I got out of the military and then when I went back into the job market. And so it's um, quite often there be, may be a need for uh, retraining or having something to put on your resume. Because what do you say when, well, I've been home for the last 15 years. Um, something that other military spouses may experience. I went to this seminar a couple of months ago and there was someone there speaking that she kind of had a similar, she was a military military service member. She got out and then was a military spouse and she was a nurse and she kind of, you know, gave a little bit of, of information on that, that um, I hadn't thought about before. So as a nurse, you know, you think you're married to the service member. Well, every couple of years you're moving. And so one of the problems that she experienced was that, well, you get licensed as a nurse within the state. And so if you move to another state or if you move to another country, you have to go through a, a process to reapply to get that license again to do the same job you've already been doing. And so a lot of military spouses have that difficulty of transferring their, their state licensures to different locations, as well as when employers look at the resume of a military spouse, you know, you may assume, well, this person may not, doesn't seem to stay at jobs very long. Every two to three years, they're getting a new job. And so on the employer side, you know, maybe asking more questions, you know, and, and having that understanding that, you know, military spouse, you know, they had to have a lot of flexibility to move along with the veteran, uh, start a new job, start a new occupation, go through all that training, um, to start over again in a couple of years. And so really military spouses are very flexible, very adaptable um, and able to adapt to a lot of different situations. And so they're a really great resource for employers to look at uh, when they're looking at hiring individuals. And that reciprocity is very interesting that you'd mentioned that from state to state. Hopefully that's being looked at at an industry level on how that can be transferable and translatable into other states if they're bringing skills, uh, whether it's in the private sector or the military um, that they've learned, um, either as a military spouse veteran or the veteran themselves. I will say one disclaimer quickly on this second bullet point, non-employment is different than unemployment rates. So we have to treat that very carefully with this statistic that was from that survey that the military spouse chamber of commerce did. That would indicate that one in five are non-employed that could be that some are not even job seeking, um, but we define unemployment as those that are, are seeking a job and are able to work um, that fall into that labor force category um, as eligible. So I just wanted to leave that disclaimer there. And um, those are all the slides that I have just based on time here. So I'll turn it back to Matt and Craig. Um, I guess uh, if, were there any further questions from the chat? Craig, that uh, of, of participants who had um, some more um, information they're looking for? Well, uh, no questions yet, but I would remind the audience that if you do have any questions, now's a good time to, to throw them into the q and I'm happy to pass them uh, to the, the panel. Um, but we did get one, um, one uh, kind of contribution to the conversation from uh, the, the, uh, the regional specialists from the VA office here in Boise, that there are a number of programs to help uh, um, disabled veterans get employment. Um, he forwarded me some links that we will include in uh, the PowerPoint that we'll be posting online. Um, and some of those are, are in state statute and federal statute as well. So there's, uh, it's written in law that there's a preference for those. So there's that as an um, assistance to get them hired. But um, also I, I, to that end, I'd also say that there's a lot of, um, you know, I would recommend to uh, any veterans in our audience or anyone that knows a veteran that's looking for this type of information that there's a, a number of resources available to them besides the Department of Labor. I mean, there's the VA regional office and probably more aware of that than me, but I would just say that it's all kind of, um, there's information in a lot of places for these types of things. So it's a big, it's a, it's a big uh, universe for, for veterans, that's for sure. Um, one question I, I would have for um, Denise and um, any numbers I might patent back this up is um, is you know one of the one of the tools the department has is um, that has been registered apprenticeships has that been something that has been a good fit for um, veteran services that the department's used at all Denise? Absolutely, and so that's something when um, local veteran employment representatives go out and meet with employers, uh, they can help with giving information on that. Uh, probably one of the huge benefits with apprenticeships 
is that um, any veteran that has the GI Bill, um, if they find an employer that's been registered with the VA as, as it, or is VA approved for uh, the GI Bill, while they're working through that apprenticeship, they're able to receive their housing stipend. Um, and then that, that proportion of that stipend will change every six months as they progress through and their wages increase. And if there's an employer that hires a veteran but is not yet registered with the VA or is not yet approved for the GI Bill, um, the Department of Labor can help them with becoming a registered apprenticeship. Uh, they always look at um, USDOL uh, apprenticeship approval. Um, so we can help them with that process. Um, and then um, once they receive that approval, then they, they, go, they get approved with the VA as well. Thank you. Um, and then also, you know, there was a couple of slides there that kind of pointed at some of the challenges veterans face. And some of those challenges are just, I mean, the same challenges the workforce face. But um, I would just ask um, veterans that are moving to Idaho or, or looking for employment in Idaho, what's been your experience in connecting with employers and getting them into a, a good spot for uh, once they get here? Um, has it been difficult or, and, and if not, and if, uh, not why would you say that it is, or if there is, what would be the kind of the one factor that you would say right now is kind of the, the biggest challenge for uh, for veterans getting employment in Idaho? Um, so I would say some of that depends upon the occupation that they're looking to get into. Some may have a longer hiring process. For example, somebody's like, I want to move to Idaho. I want to work in cybersecurity. I don't want to work for the INL. Well, there's a process to getting hired there and it's not something that you can apply when you're hired the next day. Um, you have to go through the background check and things like that. And so sometimes if it's something that may take some time, it's helping them to look at, um, are there other options to, me to meet their immediate needs while they're working towards that long-term goal? Um, quite often, uh, Veterans will reach out before they're getting out of the military or before they move to Idaho. They can go to our website and identify who's the veteran rep in the part of the state that they want to move to. And, and quite often, I'll be honest, I use the LMI information that uh, we have on the website because the LMI information on our website kind of breaks down by region, who are some of the major employers in the area, uh, kind of help them with that. And then the other thing is just that you know, I try to keep connected with employers. So anytime we have a job fair, I'm going and talking with the employers. And so the more that I know what kind of positions employers in my area offer, the more I can help veterans with identifying which employers may be in their career field and may be a good fit for them. And so it's always, um, it's always an ongoing basis, always, you know, you're always learning new information and um, reaching out and just gathering information to help that veteran. Thank you, Denise. And, and for those in the audience that don't know what LMI is, it's labor market information, which uh, thank you for the plug, Denise, because that's uh, um, our little corner of the, of the department. And that uh, if you are curious about that website, go to lmi.idaho.gov. Um, and there's uh, quite a bit of resources there for you. And um, uh, before we kind of close it up here, I think we've only got a few minutes left. Denise, uh, I wanted to say thank you for joining our, our panel today. I think you certainly made it more interesting and more informative. So thank you for that. Any any final um, comments or, or questions or, or anything you'd like to add before we, we wrap it up? Um, for, for my side, I would just encourage employers that are looking to hire more veterans with reaching out to your local veteran employment representative so you can talk with them and find things that may be more specialized to your business. And if there are veterans or veteran families on here, they're looking for resources or just have questions like, hey, I don't know where to start. You know, you should contact your local disabled veterans outreach program and meet with a veterans rep and uh, see if they can help you with identifying additional resources to help you. Okay. Thank you, Denise. Um, any final comments from uh, you, Matt, or Greg? Oh, I'm sorry, Ryan? Uh, I don't have anything more. I would uh, like to thank Denise for um, participating in this webinar. It's been nice to learn more about our vet services, which is something that um, the labor economist team do doesn't encounter regularly. So this was an opportunity to learn more about all these ways that we can uh, meet the needs of our vet population, as well as our employers who are looking to hire vets. So it's, it's nice to, to learn about all of the, the many facets of the Idaho Department of Labor. 
I will say that uh, Denise is a special guest on this panel, and I wanted to really thank her. I work with her personally in the cubicle right next door in the Idaho Falls office. She's very modest about her service. I mean, she worked at the Pentagon. That says a lot about Denise, um, and not to mention her cumulative years in the Army. Um, this The veterans topic is something very near and dear to my heart. My brother is an Army veteran, and my grandfather is an Air Force veteran. And so uh, this conversation has been very useful. The research has been very eye-opening um, on what veterans uh, uh, need and um, what they're, they're getting. And so I just wanted to um, thank all the veterans and active duty military out there for what you do for us every day. Uh, yesterday, I was thinking a lot about you as well. And um, thank you for, um, for being a contributor to this conversation, uh, both as an audience and also you, Denise. And um, we really appreciate uh, the insight you've provided. Yeah, I would, I would uh, second that from Ryan and thank you, Denise, for your service as a veteran and also for this as well. And I also like to thank our veterans that are on uh, viewing this for your service as well. It's been an, an honor to talk about this topic uh, on today's webinar and hopefully we can provide more information to you if you have it. Just don't feel free. I mean, don't hesitate to reach out to one of us um, uh, if you have any questions whatsoever. It looks like you were going to say something, Matt. Yeah, no, I, I'm seeing there was a, a question in the uh, chat um, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it off. Uh, my son recently moved from or moved home to Idaho and finally found a job with the federal government. One of his biggest concerns was the lack of communication with places he had applied. Military members are used to good communication and lack of communication frustrates them. I really understand this complaint. It's kind of very endemic to the job seeking market in general right now. Um, the the You'd think that with the change in advancements in technology, it, it would make it much more easier for employers to to screen candidates and then follow up, even if just even if it's just as something as simple as a, a very a very boilerplate email uh, or phone call. It's still something that a lot of job seekers are encountering right now, and I would encourage um, many of our vets who are accustomed to perhaps very direct and, and timely communication to understand that, uh, unfortunately, things work a little bit different in the civilian labor force and to um, be, try to remain optimistic. Um, um, you are a very valuable person, have a lot of very valuable skills. Uh, it might not mean that every employer um, takes the time and effort to reach out to you uh, about your application uh, or where you stand in the um, candidate screening process, but um, it's just unfortunately the the what a lot of job seekers are encountering right now. Yeah, that's a good point, Matt. Thank you for getting that. Um, I, I almost think we, we should do another webinar on, on the changing like like difference in what people ex what what people expect in the in the job seeking market now in terms of just I guess manners for lack of a better phrase at the moment and what's actually happening. Cause I, I agree with you there's definitely some uh, some it's become more cold than it, than it used to be. So, um, but uh, obviously, hopefully, we can connect with that person that sent that question. If there's any questions for us, happy to help out any way we can. So, um, um, any uh, final comments for the second time? <laughs> Otherwise, I'll, I'll close it up. Um, all right. So, again, thank you for attending our webinar. We were we very much enjoyed this one, and we en enjoyed having this for you. Um, our next webinar is already scheduled for October 10th. Uh, our Lewiston labor economists will be talking about, um, a little, and Lisa Grigg, uh, she'll be talking about balancing uh, Idaho's po high population growth uh, with low birth rates and how that's causing a shift in population and the its effects on K-12 and school enrollments. Um, we'd also like to remind you that the Idaho Department of Labor has many services geared towards job seekers, employers, but um, it also includes free access to labor market information that we already gave a plug at, but I'll give it again lmi.idaho.gov. And there you've got, there's a little uh, menu at the top for regional information. It'll take you to a page that has a list of all our regional economists with the area they're representing. Uh, there's also some nice PDFs there that give some um, uh, regional uh, statistics that you can um, access for free. Um, and also the contact information, should you have any questions for any of us. So um, again, I'd like to thank Denise and our veterans for listening. Um, and Matt and Ryan, well done on the on the job. And um, thank you very much. Appreciate it.